After our wedding, I crossed the line with a coworker. It made my husband violent. Credit, my name is Ashley and I'm a 33-year-old woman. My husband's name is Justin and he's a 34-year-old man. We've been married for about six years and have one kid who I'll call Max. He's about five. My husband and I, we've known each other all our lives. Crazy things have happened and I thought I'd share them here with you. My husband brutally assaulted the colleague I had cheated on with at a corporate party. It's been a whirlwind, and I'm still trying to make sense of it all. Yeah. Justin and I have known each other practically forever. We grew up in the same neighborhood, went to the same schools, and shared a lot of memories. But it wasn't until after college that we started seeing each other in a different light. Our first official date was a mix of nostalgia and excitement. Yeah. We decided to keep it simple and went to our favorite childhood pizza place. Sitting across from each other, I couldn't help but smile, thinking about all the years we'd known each other. Justin was charming as ever, telling me stories from our school days that made me laugh until tears streamed down my face. After dinner, we took a walk through the old neighborhood, reminiscing about our adventures as kids. It felt like no time had passed at all, yet everything had changed. We even stood on the street corner where we used to wait for the school bus. Justin took my hand and looked into my eyes, and in that moment, I knew that our relationship was something truly special. For our second date, Justin planned a surprise outing. He picked me up in the afternoon and drove us to a nearby beach. It was a beautiful day, with the sun shining brightly and a gentle breeze blowing. We walked along the shore, talking and laughing, enjoying each other's company. Justin had packed a picnic, and we sat on a blanket, eating sandwiches and watching the waves. As the sun began to set, he took my hand and led me to the water's edge. We stood there, watching the sunset, and in that moment, everything felt perfect. After the sun had set, we walked back to the car, hand in hand, reluctant to let go of the magic of the evening. Justin drove me home, and we sat in the car outside my house, talking and laughing until late into the night. It was a perfect second date, and I knew then that I was falling for him. For our third date, Justin surprised me by taking me to a cozy little Italian restaurant downtown. The ambiance was romantic, with soft lighting and Italian music playing in the background. We shared a delicious meal of pasta and wine, laughing and talking as if we had known each other for years. After dinner, Justin suggested we take a walk in the nearby park. It was a warm summer evening and the park was beautiful, with flowers in full bloom and fireflies dancing in the air. We walked hand in hand, stopping occasionally to sit on a bench and enjoy the view. As we walked, we talked about our hopes and dreams for the future. Justin told me about his job and his passion for music, while I shared my love for art and travel. It felt like we were opening up to each other in a way we hadn't before, and I knew then that this was something special. For our fourth date, Justin took me to a local art gallery, knowing my love for art. It was a small, intimate gallery featuring local artists, and I was thrilled to explore it with him. We spent hours wandering through the exhibits, discussing our favorite pieces and sharing our thoughts on art and life. After the gallery, Justin surprised me by taking me to a nearby park where a live jazz band was playing. We sat on a blanket under the stars, listening to the music and talking late into the night. It was such a romantic and thoughtful gesture, and I felt incredibly lucky to be with him. As the night came to a close, Justin walked me back to my car, and we shared a sweet and tender kiss goodnight. I knew then that I had fallen absolutely in love with him and wanted to spend the rest of my life with him. For our fifth date, Justin planned a romantic evening at a fancy restaurant in the city. He picked me up and surprised me with a bouquet of my favorite flowers, roses, which made me feel so special. The restaurant he chose had a cozy atmosphere with dim lighting and soft music, creating the perfect ambiance for a romantic dinner. Justin had made reservations, and we were seated at a private table by the window, overlooking the city skyline. Throughout the evening, we shared stories, laughed, and enjoyed delicious food and wine. Justin was such a gentleman, pulling out my chair, refilling my glass, and making sure I felt comfortable and cared for. After dinner, Justin suggested we take a walk along the riverfront. It was a beautiful night, and the city lights reflected off the water, creating a magical scene. We walked hand in hand, talking and laughing, enjoying each other's company. As the night came to an end, Justin walked me back to my car, and we shared a passionate kiss goodnight. I legit couldn't stop smiling as I drove home, and I felt so grateful to have him in my life. For our sixth date, my heart was fluttered with excitement. Justin and I had been growing closer with each date, 
and I couldn't wait to see what he had planned for us this time. From our first meeting as kids to our first kiss, each moment had been filled with laughter and love. Justin had a way of making me feel special, and I cherished every moment we spent together. When Justin arrived, he greeted me with a bouquet of flowers and a warm smile. He looked handsome in his suit, and I felt a surge of affection for him. We drove to a fancy restaurant downtown, where Justin had made reservations for us. And the restaurant was elegant, with soft lighting and a romantic atmosphere. Justin led me to our table, and we sat down to peruse the menu. We talked and laughed, sharing stories and jokes as we enjoyed our meal. After dinner, Justin surprised me by taking me to a nearby park. The park was beautifully lit up with fairy lights, and a gentle breeze rustled through the trees. Justin took my hand and led me to a secluded spot overlooking a lake. We sat down on a bench and Justin pulled out a small box from his pocket. My heart skipped a beat as he opened the box to reveal a beautiful necklace. It was simple yet elegant, and I knew it was perfect for me. Taking the necklace, Justin gently placed it around my neck. I could feel tears pricking at the corner of my eyes as I realized how much Justin truly cared for me. He leaned in and kissed me softly, and I melted into his embrace. As we sat there wrapped in each other's arms, I knew that this was the man I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. Justin was kind, loving, and thoughtful, and I felt incredibly lucky to have him by my side. Then we decided to move in together. Moving in together was a big step for us. We were both excited to start this new chapter in our relationship, but it also came with its challenges. One of the biggest struggles we faced was merging our lifestyles and habits. Justin was very organized and liked things a certain way, while I was more laid back and tended to be a bit messy. We had to find a balance and learn to compromise on things like household chores and decorating our home. Another challenge was managing our finances. We both had our own ways of budgeting and spending money, and we had to learn to align our financial goals and priorities. Despite these challenges, moving in together also brought us closer. We learned more about each other and grew as a couple. It was a learning experience but one that ultimately strengthened our relationship. Justin's proposal was a moment I'll never forget. He took me to our favorite spot in the city, a beautiful park with a view of the skyline. It was a perfect evening. The sun was setting, and the sky was painted with hues of pink and orange. We walked through the park. Justin suddenly got down on one knee and pulled out a ring. He poured his heart out, telling me how much he loved me and how he wanted to spend the rest of his life with me. It was such a romantic and heartfelt moment, and I couldn't hold back my tears of joy. Of course, I said yes. We were both over the moon with happiness. When we dove into wedding planning, things became more stressful than I ever imagined. Justin's parents, being wealthy, offered to buy us a house in any location of our choosing. It was an incredibly generous offer, but there was a catch. My name wouldn't be on the deed. Justin's parents had never been fond of me, and this was their way of exerting control over our lives. The house became a point of contention between Justin and me. He wanted to accept his parents' offer, seeing it as a practical choice, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being sidelined and disrespected. It led to many arguments and tense discussions about our future, but I eventually agreed and yielded. On top of that, wedding planning itself was overwhelming. There were so many decisions to make, from the guest list to the venue to the flowers. Justin's parents had strong opinions about everything, adding to the stress. I felt like I was losing control over my own wedding, and it strained our relationship. Despite the challenges, we managed to pull off a beautiful wedding. But the tensions with Justin's parents and the house issue did linger a bit. A few months after we had just gotten married, I found out I was pregnant. It was a mix of excitement and nervousness, but we couldn't wait to welcome our first child. We decided to name him Max, a name we both loved. The first few months of my pregnancy were filled with excitement and joy. Justin and I were thrilled to be starting a family together, and we eagerly awaited the arrival of our little one. However, as my pregnancy progressed, I began to experience some unexpected challenges. I struggled with morning sickness, which seemed to last all day and made it difficult to eat or even get out of bed. I was constantly tired, and simple tasks like cooking dinner or doing laundry felt like insurmountable obstacles. Justin was incredibly supportive, but I could see the worry in his eyes as he watched me struggle. My belly grew, and so did my discomfort. I experienced backaches, swollen feet, and constant heartburn. I found it difficult to find a comfortable position to sleep in, and I often woke up feeling more tired than when I had gone to bed. Justin did his best to help, rubbing my back and feet, 
and reassuring me that everything would be okay. Despite the physical challenges, the emotional toll of pregnancy was even greater. I worried constantly about the health and well-being of our baby. Every twinge or ache sent me into a panic, and I found myself constantly checking my phone for messages from my doctor. Justin was my rock during this time, calming my fears and reminding me that we were in this together. And when my due date approached, the anticipation and anxiety grew. I was excited to meet our baby, but I was also terrified of the unknown. Would I be a good mother? Would our baby be healthy? Justin was my constant source of reassurance, holding my hand through every contraction and whispering words of encouragement in my ear. When our son Max was finally born, all the struggles of pregnancy faded away. Holding him in my arms, I knew that every moment of discomfort had been worth it. However, Justin's parents saw this as another opportunity to assert control. They had strong opinions about everything, including the name of their grandson. They wanted us to choose a name from their family's tradition, but we were set on Max. Justin, to my surprise, stood firm. He made it clear to his parents that this was our decision to make, and that if they couldn't respect that, he would consider cutting off contact with them. It was a bold move, but it worked. His parents realized that Justin was serious and eventually yielded, accepting Max as the name for their grandson. It was a turning point in our relationship with Justin's parents. They began to understand that we were a family unit now, and they couldn't dictate our choices. It was a huge relief to know that we could make decisions for our family without interference. As Max grew, so did the challenges in our lives. Justin had always been passionate about music, but his parents never approved. Instead, they influenced him to take a job at their company, which paid exceptionally well. This job allowed Justin to take care of all the bills, which was a relief for me, as I tended to spend more extravagantly. However, Justin's job came at a cost. He didn't enjoy it, and it took a toll on his happiness. Despite the financial security it provided, Justin felt unfulfilled. On the other hand, I had a regular 9-5 job in a corporate setting. It wasn't as glamorous or well-paying as Justin's job, but it gave me a sense of purpose. Despite our different career paths, Justin and I were committed to making our marriage work. We supported each other through the ups and downs until I fucked up. The morning of our wedding day was a flurry of excitement and nerves. I sat in front of the mirror and my hands trembling slightly. I couldn't believe that the day I had dreamed of since I was a little girl was finally here. I slipped into my wedding dress feeling like a princess and took a deep breath and tried to calm my racing heart. When I walked down the aisle towards Justin, I felt a wave of emotions wash over me. I was filled with love for this man who had been by my side through thick and thin, and gratitude for all the friends and family who had come to celebrate with us. During the ceremony when we exchanged vows, I felt tears prickling at the corners of my eyes. I promised to love Justin for the rest of my days, and I meant every word with all my heart. The reception was a whirlwind of joy and laughter. We danced, we ate, we toasted to our future together. And when I looked around at the smiling faces of our loved ones, I knew that this was the happiest day of my life. After Max was born and I took some time off work to focus on being a mother, I started to feel a bit restless. Don't get me wrong, I love being at home with Max, but I missed the sense of purpose that came with working. I missed interacting with other adults and using my skills in a professional setting. So when Max was about four years old, I started looking for a job. Justin suggested that I work at his parents' company, which was a well-established firm with a lot of opportunities for growth. However, I didn't feel comfortable working there. I wanted my own identity separate from Justin and his family, and I felt that working at his parents' company would blur those lines. Instead, I decided to look for a job in the corporate world, and that was how I landed a job at a local company, and I was excited to get back into the workforce. Justin was supportive of my decision, and he encouraged me to pursue my career goals. Starting a new job while also taking care of Max was challenging, but I was determined to make it work. I hired a nanny to help with childcare, and Justin pitched in whenever he could. The person placed in charge of training me was a man named Mark. He was charming, friendly, and always had a smile on his face. From the moment we met, he made me feel welcome and valued. He was patient and took the time to explain things to me, making sure I understood everything before moving on. As we spent more time together, I couldn't help but notice how easy it was to talk to him. He was a great listener and always had a way of putting me at ease. We shared a lot of laughs during our training sessions, and I found myself starting to look forward to our time together. 
I found myself drawn to Mark's attention and the way he made me feel. His charming demeanor and efforts to make me feel special were a welcome change from the routine I had grown tired of. At first, his flirtatious behavior was subtle, but as time went on, it became more pronounced. He would go out of his way to bring me snacks or coffee, and his compliments on my outfits made me feel noticed in a way I hadn't in a long time. As I reflected on my life, I realized I was stuck in a repetitive cycle that left me feeling unfulfilled. Each day blurred into the next, with little to differentiate them. Taking care of the house, spending time with Justin, and then settling into a predictable evening routine had become the norm. To be honest, it was like I found myself falling into a rut, stuck in the same routine day in and day out. The monotony of it all was suffocating. Every day seemed like a carbon copy of the one before, and I yearned for something different, something exciting to break the cycle. My life had become a predictable pattern and started to feel restless. I was craving a change from the mundane existence I had fallen into. Ah! The thought of breaking this monotony with something exciting and different was incredibly appealing. So when Mark's attention and flirtations provided a spark of excitement, I found myself eagerly welcoming it, craving the change it represented. As time went on, Mark and I developed a close friendship. We shared similar interests and had an easy rapport that made our conversations flow effortlessly. We would discuss the latest movies or gossip about celebrities, finding common ground in our shared enjoyment of pop culture. It was refreshing to have someone like Mark to talk to, especially since Justin had become increasingly distant. Justin seemed to have lost interest in our relationship, focusing more on his work and our kid Max. While I appreciated his efforts to make things work between us, it felt like he was no longer the carefree, fun-loving person I had fallen in love with in college. The pressures of adult life had taken their toll on him, and his best efforts were no longer enough to fulfill me in the way they once had. Our relationship had lost the spark and excitement it once had, leaving me longing for the carefree days of our youth. As Justin became more engrossed in our son Max's life, I found myself gravitating more towards Mark. Our conversations extended beyond the confines of work and started spilling into the weekends when I was at home. It was effortless to talk to Mark and our chats became a welcome escape from the mundane routine of my married life. While Justin seemed preoccupied with our child and other responsibilities, Mark provided a refreshing break from the monotony. I began to realize that Justin's focus had shifted almost entirely to Max, leaving little room for our relationship. While we still shared intimate moments and occasional deep conversations, they were overshadowed by the overwhelming responsibility of parenthood. I longed for the carefree days of our youth when our relationship was the center of our world. Justin's dedication to our son was admirable, but it left me feeling neglected and yearning for a connection that went beyond the duties of parenting. It didn't take long before my outings with Mark turned into something more. What started as innocent activities like watching a movie or taking a walk soon evolved into secret rendezvous at hotels. Both Mark and I were married, so our homes were off limits. We had to find other places to meet, usually resorting to our cars or booking hotel rooms. Since Justin took care of all the household bills, I used my salary to cover the cost of the hotel rooms. Despite the guilt I felt for betraying my husband, the affair with Mark brought a sense of excitement and thrill into my life. There was something exhilarating about sneaking around and engaging in a forbidden romance. While I still loved Justin, I found myself starting to get addicted to the excitement and passion that Mark had brought into my life. As my affair with Mark consumed more of my time and attention, I found myself becoming increasingly distant from Justin. I was constantly glued to my phone, exchanging messages with Mark and making sure to turn off my location whenever I wasn't at home. Despite my slip-ups, Justin seemed oblivious, his focus consumed by work and our son Max. Justin's impending promotion to CEO as his father was now looking to retire only added to his workload, leaving him with little time to notice my growing disengagement. That also meant that Max was way closer to Justin than he was to me, and while I was happy to see Justin bonding with Max, I couldn't shake the feeling of being sidelined in my own family. However, then I didn't care because I was still high off the thrill Mark gave me. One time Justin almost caught me lying. I had told him I was working overtime, but the truth was far from it. I was at a hotel with Mark, lost in the thrill of our forbidden affair. Justin then called again a few minutes later asking where I was. Panicking, I lied, telling him I had decided not to work late and was on my way home. I could hear the concern in his voice, and it tore at my conscience. I had that. The thing is, Justin had gone out of his way to bring me food, to surprise me with a thoughtful gesture only to find out I wasn't at work. 
but instead I was deceiving him, betraying his trust. The guilt weighed heavily on me. I hurriedly ended the call and rushed to head home. I knew that I was playing a dangerous game that could cost me everything, but it was like I just couldn't stop. I see, thank you for the guidance. Here's the revised version. One time I even skipped Max's school play to be with Mark. Max was looking forward to seeing me there, but I let him down. Justin was also disappointed in me. I lied and said I was working hard for a promotion, but I think they knew it was a lie. Max didn't speak to me for days, and I could see him growing even closer to Justin. My heart really aches with guilt, and I know now that I had hurt my son and damaged my relationship with him. My lies only pushed them further away, and I am now realizing too late the price of my actions. Justin made earnest attempts to bridge the widening gap in our marriage. He planned surprise date nights, showered me with expressions of love, and tried to involve me more in his life and our sons. Despite his efforts, I found it increasingly challenging to reciprocate. My heart and mind were elsewhere, busy in the web of my affair with Mark. Justin's gestures, though genuine, felt like fleeting moments of respite from the inevitable realization that our marriage was crumbling, and I was too far gone to salvage it. As my affair with Mark continued, I found myself growing distant from everyone around me. My relationship with Justin had deteriorated, and our sex life had dwindled to nothing. The closeness I once shared with Max also began to fade. I felt lost, consumed by guilt and longing, unable to connect with those who mattered most. My affair with Mark had taken over my life, leaving little room for anything else. As my affair with Mark escalated, it seemed like everyone at the company knew about our secret relationship. Looking back, I'm surprised that none of my coworkers reached out to Justin or Mark's wife to expose the truth. The guilt weighed heavily on me, knowing that my actions were not only hurting my family, but also affecting my reputation at work. Despite the risks, I couldn't bring myself to end the affair. My desire for something different, something exciting, had completely clouded my judgment and was leading me down a destructive path. The company Christmas party was supposed to be a festive event, but it quickly turned into a nightmare. Justin had insisted on coming to my company's party, now that I think about it. I realized he insisted on coming with me because he didn't want me cheating on him with Mark. Either way, so we had arranged for a babysitter to watch Max for the evening. Everything was going well until Mark, in his usual smug manner, decided to approach us. He was incredibly arrogant, implying things and bragging about how he took care of me at work, even referring to himself as my work husband. I tried to brush off his comments and get him to leave us alone, but he persisted. Justin, who had been trying to contain his anger, finally snapped. He turned red with fury and launched himself at Mark. Mark, who clearly wasn't expecting such a reaction, was caught off guard and quickly found himself on the receiving end of Justin's rage. It was a chaotic and humiliating scene, one that I wish had never happened. The aftermath of Justin's outburst was chaotic. He beat Mark brutally, and I was shocked by the violence of it all. Everyone just stood there watching, and no one tried to intervene. Some even said that Mark deserved it, but I couldn't bring myself to get involved, fearing I might inadvertently become a target. After beating Mark to a pulp, Justin stormed off and took the car, leaving me stranded without a way home because we had come together. I tried to stop him, but he was too consumed by anger to listen. From the things he said during the altercation, I realized that he knew about my affair. It was a terrifying realization, but I knew I had to follow him and talk to him. He said stuff like, I've tolerated you long enough and you think I didn't know. So I knew that he definitely knew, but what I didn't know was how much he knew and how long he had known about me and Mark. Unfortunately, I was left without a ride home. I asked some co-workers for help, but most of them refused, likely believing I deserved the situation. I even tried to order an Uber, but my card was frozen, which I later realized was likely Justin's doing. Eventually, after much pleading, a co-worker agreed to give me a ride home, where I hoped to confront Justin and explain myself. When I arrived home, Justin and Max weren't there. I let myself in and decided to wait up for Justin. Max wasn't with the babysitter, so I assumed they had returned home. I tried to track Justin's location on my phone, but he had stopped sharing it. I sent him several texts, but he didn't respond. In a desperate attempt to make amends, I deleted all messages between me and Mark from my phone. Hours later, Justin finally returned home with Max. He seemed much calmer and had even bought Max a lollipop. Justin was surprised to see me and asked why I was there instead of going home with Max. I tried to come up with an excuse, but he saw through it. He asked me why I hadn't gone home with Max and I knew I had to come clean. 
I told him everything and lied and even said it had only happened once, and I begged for his forgiveness. I was in tears, and Justin was visibly upset by the revelation. When I confessed to Justin, he looked at me with a mix of sadness and disappointment. He told me that he had known about my affair with Mark for months and that he had been struggling with how to handle the situation. Justin admitted that he had hoped I would come clean on my own, but my lies had shattered any chance of him forgiving me. He asked me why I would cheat and seemed resigned to the fact that our marriage was over. Justin said he didn't care much anymore, as he had had months to come to terms with the idea that I was no longer the person he thought I was and that I was now for the streets. I was so relieved when Justin didn't kick me out after I confessed everything. He said he would try to save our marriage, at least for Max's sake. I was overwhelmed with gratitude and cried tears of joy, thanking him profusely. But then he laid out his conditions. He would sleep in the guest room, and I had to quit my job and donate a lot of my stuff to charity as punishment for cheating. I was shocked by his demands, but I was ready to do anything to save our marriage. The next day I resigned from my job, and although I was supposed to give a two-week notice, my boss didn't mind because he was planning to fire me anyway because of the altercation at the dinner party. He said it was all my fault and that he was thinking of even firing Mark, but honestly so couldn't care less about Mark now. I also even suggested couples counseling, which Justin agreed to. In the weeks that followed my agreement to donate many of my belongings to charity, I felt like I was starting fresh. However, that sense of renewal was short-lived when I discovered that Justin had been deceiving me. He emptied our joint savings account. Despite feeling betrayed, I tried to focus on making amends for my past mistakes, as I felt that was my due punishment for cheating. Plus, much of the money was his anyway, so I couldn't argue with that. I knew that without Justin, I would struggle financially. He was the breadwinner, and I had always been financially dependent on him due to my extravagant spending habits. He earned almost nine times what I did. I also realized that losing him would mean losing custody of Max, as Justin earned significantly more and Max had grown closer to him. Despite my efforts to rebuild our relationship, Justin abruptly kicked me out one day. I had gone grocery shopping and I decided to take Max with me, but Justin refused saying he was taking me out. I didn't mind because Max didn't seem to want to go with me anyways. I was still working on earning back his truth, but that is a slow process. I went out alone and when I returned, I found my belongings on the porch. I couldn't believe it. After everything, Justin was kicking me out. I called him, desperate to talk, to make him understand but he didn't pick up. Then a text message came, cold and final. He said he couldn't forgive me and that I had to leave, to go stay with my parents. It felt like a punch to the gut. I packed my things, I felt numb, tears were blurring my vision. Arriving at my parents' house, their shocked expressions literally mirrored my own. I was still reeling from the fact that Justin had cold-heartedly kicked me out. My parents welcomed me warmly, without pressing for details. It was a relief not to have to explain myself immediately, but that respite was short-lived. Before the day even ended, Justin took matters into his own hands. He created a group chat that included me, my parents, and everyone else that we knew. In this chat, he dropped a bombshell, screenshots from my phone. Private messages and photos, ones I believed were hidden or locked away, were now laid bare for all to see. The betrayal cut deep, adding a new layer of humiliation and pain to the already devastating situation. I felt exposed, vulnerable, and utterly betrayed. My parents, shocked and saddened by the revelation, tried to console me as best they could. They didn't pry, but their silence spoke volumes. I could see the disappointment in their eyes, and it only added to my shame. Justin's actions were deliberate and calculated. He wanted to hurt me, to show the world what I had done. It was a cruel and vindictive move, one that shattered any remaining hope I had of reconciliation. The days following everything was crazy. My phone buzzed incessantly with messages from my in-laws. Their words were dripping with disdain. They accused me of never deserving Justin. They said I was always for the streets and that I never deserved Justin. Then Justin also sent me a message stating he would be serving me with divorce papers soon. As if that wasn't enough, my friends chimed in, their messages heavy with disappointment and judgment. I felt the weight of their words crushing me, adding to the overwhelming emotions I was already dealing with. My friends who I hoped would offer comfort or understanding were expressing their disappointment. It was a lonely feeling, knowing I had let down not just my husband, but everyone who cared about us. But the final blow came from Mark. He had previously blocked me, but he unblocked me and accused me of being a vindictive bitch. 
He claimed I had sent screenshots and pictures of our conversations to his wife. He called me a vindictive bitch, saying his marriage was now in jeopardy. I had to set the record straight, explaining that it was likely Justin who had exposed our affair, not me. Now, with my finances in ruins and my marriage shattered, I have to depend on my parents for support. It is a humbling experience, facing the consequences of my actions and realizing the depth of the hurt I had caused. Not being able to see my child and Justin's distant demeanor has even to the pain. He won't talk to me unless it's for something important. I also know I'm facing an uphill battle in the divorce proceedings. Justin Wylow likely get custody, and I will lose so much more than just my marriage. My brother, a lawyer, has also acknowledged this reality but can't represent me due to a conflict of interest and his lack of expertise in divorces. So I guess my message to you is please don't cheat, it's honestly not worth it at all. Thanks for listening. Hey, I hope someone will see this. It's 2.57 a.m. as I write this and I just can't take it anymore. My wife keeps talking down on me and it's eating me up. For context. I, 43 and my wife, 39 have been married for 12 years. It has been a fun ride, but now it seems like the park is shutting down and the Ferris wheel is the first thing the bringing down. This might get long, I hope this place isn't like X where there's a limit to how many words you can write. I work in construction, always have. I came from a humble background, even though I and my two siblings went to government schools, we still couldn't afford to finish school. Aged just 16, I dropped out to find a job so that both my younger siblings could be able to afford it even if it was a community college. Due to my low-level education, I was only able to get menial duties, that was until I got a job in construction working under a friend of my late father's, may his soul rest in peace. I worked this job, juggling it with some other little chores that paid me. At some point I was working four jobs and sleeping only three hours a day. How I didn't break down, I never knew. I still don't know. My younger siblings were twins, both currently 40 and they were just two years behind me academically then. My late dad, who was already bedridden, died when the twins were in their sophomore year in uni. So my mother and I shouldered the responsibility of funding their schooling. See I never wanted any of them to have any student debt in their name, that was why I worked as hard as I did. It didn't take much for them to both graduate as they were both smart kids. The boy, John, got a job as a doctor and the girl, Antoinette, quickly got a job in a huge law firm. On my 26th birthday, I was gifted a house by the twins. It was one of the best days in my existence. I thought to myself, phew. I can finally rest. I remember not working throughout that week as I wanted to enjoy the house my siblings bought me. It was during this week of rest, I met my soulmate. I had gone into a Starbucks close to the Cleveland State University when I saw her. A beautiful lady sitting on her own, studying. Hey everyone. Unfortunately, basically everyone who is watching these videos isn't subscribed. It would mean the world to me to quickly get out of the full screen video for three seconds and press that subscribe button. It's free and you can unsubscribe anytime. Sorry for bothering and thank you so much if you subscribed. She was glancing at a book on building engineering and was shaking her head and murmuring to herself. I guess she might have been having problems with it, so I decided to peek. When I peeped over her shoulder at what she was doing, I found that she was doing some sort of exercise that had to do with interpretation of building plan drawings. Well it was the sort of thing I had spent years doing. I got carried away while taking a peek at her work, I thank god I wasn't born in this new generation as that kind of thing might have been labeled as a creepy, or something. While I was cross-checking her work, I find it quite cute, the mistakes she made in her interpretations how she outswung an in-swing door or where the put a slide window when the plan suggested the windows should have doors. Hey, Snoop Dogg. What are you snooping at? She said, calling my attention as she waved her hand in my face. I looked at her and… Lord have mercy, I knew she was beautiful but wow. I hastily snapped out of my fairy tale imagination and responded, oh, me? Nothing. It's just that I'm looking at you trying so hard to interpret this bit you're making a few mistakes. Oh really? She asked, how would you know, she added. I took a seat in front of hers and stretched out my left hand to her. Feel, I said. She looked at me for a few before reluctantly running her hands across mine. 
You work in construction? She asked, I nodded. Then I grabbed a plan and motioned her to come close so I could explain further. After a few lessons and a ton of jokes, we were done with her stuff. This has been a very good not first date, I said. Can I get your contacts so we could have a date that doesn't need this many books around? I added, it was a shot in the dark but I had to. She obliged and days later we had other dates. Soon we became inseparable, she would come over to sites where I worked and would chit chat with me during my breaks, soon enough, everyone I worked with got familiar with her. They all loved her. Sometimes she came with food, she was a very good chef and she made such delicious meals. Months later, she graduated from uni, it wasn't long after that, we decided she would move in with me. Some people would have said a thing or two about it being rushed, but I didn't think it was. It was perfect. She encouraged me to go back to school, stating that she didn't mind carrying the load of providing for both of us. I told the twins about her and my decision to go back to school, they both encouraged and chipped in enough money for me to enroll in schools. After talking to people, I decided to go to school part-time. Three years later I finally graduated uni also. I decided to study civil engineering. That day went straight to the top five best days of my life. At the ceremony, in front of her friends, family and mine also, I asked her to marry me. At this time I was already pushing 30. With the help of my siblings, I prepared all the financial aspects of being married. John, the doctor, helps us to secure the best health insurance plans for us and the kids we might have on the way. My sister, on the other hand, helps with legal matters. At the request of Marie Angela and I, she drew up a prenup. She also helped us select an insurance company, which her firm defends, one that helps in a lot of things. Two years later, we got married. I, 31 and she is 27. It wasn't a big wedding, though I still think it was. 100 people was a lot. Before then I didn't even know I knew 100 people. The wedding was a success and the night after felt heavenly. Sorry if I haven't started to explain my predicament, I just think a bigger picture is needed. Anyway, during our years of being together, I have had a couple work-related injuries. Some serious, leaving with crutches and wheelchairs, others just minor things. This was where I was very happy with John and the health insurance plan he helped me with. I had been out of the hospital a number of times, but I never got hit with the truckloads of healthcare bills. Now, we have three children, in the same format as me and my siblings. A male first child and a boy and girl twin. The boy, Prince, now 10 is a very bright kid, he's so smart I think he inherited it from his mom, the twins, Emmanuel and Emanuela, are both three. Two years ago, I got involved in another work accident. I had fallen off an overhead bridge I was inspecting as the chief engineer, it was bad, probably the worst one yet. I was hospitalized for months. Luckily, during my period at the hospital, young Emma, as I fondly called her, worked remotely. She spent most of her time by my side in the hospital. She brings her laptop to the hospital, she uses my legs as her desk. To be honest, I couldn't even feel anything. I was happy having her around, she was the only bit of happiness I had in those long periods. I spent three months in the hospital, before I got discharged. The doctor told my wife to bring me in for physiotherapy once a week. I was still crippled. Although at this point, I could feel my legs, I couldn't move them. I had rented out the house my siblings bought for me and was making close to $2,000 a month from rent. That wasn't enough though. My wife, due to now working remotely, had had her salary slashed. This was something she agreed to because she wanted to be around me. We started a mortgage plan for a bungalow apartment, which was wheelchair accessible. The house was previously owned by a war veteran, who lost his legs in Nam. The house was nice, the vet had some of his stuff still in the house. His medals were still there, there also were a couple of hand-made chairs and hand-carved toys, plus the tools used for carving and a handbook on making such crafts. I spent most of my days in what I started to call the handy house, to be honest it felt good, the peace and quiet in there and being able to make myself useful. I carved designs and built our dinner table and chairs, with the help of former co-workers, I was able to add a fireplace to the house. 
I know I was probably going through a midlife crisis caused by me by the accident. I just knew I had to be useful somehow. Obviously, I couldn't work at all for two years, I couldn't even stand up for 30 minutes straight, much less work, much less going back to the high-risk job I have been working since I was 19. Due to me being incapacitated, money became tight for us. My wife's job no longer paid well, I wasn't even doing anything and we had three other mouths to feed. My wife started to complain, and rightfully so cause something had to be done and it had to be done quickly. She talked to me about taking up smaller scale construction gigs that doesn't need me to move a muscle as I was in charge and had my own team. I tried reasoning with her, telling her that it wasn't as easy as it seemed, that I had to move around when on duty, that I'm not one of those who only bark orders, that I love to also get my hands dirty. That I couldn't until I could walk again. She was understanding at first, but as time went on, I guess the burden of shouldering the cost of our livelihood started to weigh on her. She started to raise her voice at me. But for a few reasons, I would have thought she was only with me because of the money. She was with me when there wasn't much and she helped me get a degree, which helped me get jobs that paid more. If not for her, I probably would still be living small and earning chicken feed. She helped me grow and she wasn't like one of those girls who only watched from the stands, she played a huge role in my growth as a man. I tried my best to get back to normal, put in every effort at the physio, to be able to stand on my own even, it all seemed futile. I decided, if I couldn't work, I might as well become a good house husband for now. I did everything in the house, since all the rooms were wheelchair accessible, I didn't have any problems cleaning, mopping, washing, cooking and doing other things. I mentioned earlier that my wife is a good cook. Well, I'm a better one. The kids loved having me around. We would play whenever they came home from school, I'd carry the twins while Prince would push the chair around the compound. It was all fun with the kids, M.A. though, not so much. Understandably so. The complaints became worse with each month. This time it had branched out of just being about money. Now it was about everything. The food's not salted enough. You spend so much time in the handy house. You're not a kid anymore. Sure, you missed out on playing as a kid cause you had to raise your siblings. Well listen, it time to raise your own kids, this is not time to make up for the fun you missed out on. Oh, and let's not forget, the worst of them all. The bedroom. The accident made me immobile, I couldn't feel anything below the belt. I do get hard sometimes, but I don't feel anything. This really hurt our sex life. I can't blame her for being angry, pissed, frustrated or all of the above because honestly, I felt so too. Still feel so even when I write this. Honestly, I was glad she was still talking about it, the lack of sex that is. Reason being that I figured if she stopped talking, it means she's found alternatives, alternatives I knew I won't be very pleased with. Just last week, things took a dreadful turn. Whilst M.A. was in the study, working at noon when my kids came back from school, I wanted to do a little daddy's stuff. I had heard my Emmanuel ask his mum last night, Mummy, why doesn't daddy throw me up like you normally do? It was a genuine question he asked, born from the need to know. I hurt hearing that. I felt like my wife was doubt dating me. So, I thought I'd do so today. As the twins ran to greet me, I caught Ella and threw her in the air, twice. Obviously Emmanuel wanted to have his turn so I did the same, caught him the first time and threw him again. This time he went forward. I didn't even have any idea why he moved forward. I wasn't able to catch him. He fell face first to the floor. His cries drew the attention of my wife and she came running out. This time Ella had joined the crying. I could only sit on the chair looking at them. I couldn't reach for my son who was on the floor, for fear of falling on him and making things worse. My wife picked him up, turning his face to try and console him. Though was bleeding from the nose. I got even more devastated. My wife inquired what happened and my oldest son told her everything. The glare was absolutely frightening. She had the look of a hungry bald eagle in her eyes. She dialed 911. The ambulance pulled up in a minute and they were rushed to the Um. I got there 30 minutes later. Rolling around the hospital lobby looking at the nurses begging for anyone to pay any attention to me. 
Honestly, it was a busy day that day, it was as though everyone in the vicinity were either sick or injured. Moments later, young M.A. walked out of a room visible from where I stood, sorry sat. I rolled over to her and tapped her by the waist, as that was as I could reach, because I was sitting. The anger that had already leather eyes returned. Get the fuck out of here you useless piece of shit, she said. I was a little taken aback but I stayed. I followed her into the room, where I saw my son lying on the bed with a bandage around his head. He was sleeping. How is he? I asked my wife. She didn't respond, I asked again and she kept mute again. I asked the third time, she snapped at me again, why tf are you here, you've successfully ruined your life, sitting on your ass for two years. Do you want to ruin my sons? I was saddened, I didn't know whether to be offensive or defensive about it. I just sat where I was, looking her in the eyes. I felt my eyes start to water. Are you going to cry now? She went again. Oh, hey, everybody, for a limited time only, you get to watch a grown man cry. Gather around she shouted, as she raised her hands, beckoning passersby to walk in. I buried my head in my hand. I have to solve this, but to be honest, I don't know how to. We argued for a while, I tried to calm her down and explain that things aren't all that bad, that Emma is alive and well, that we didn't need to worry about hospital bills, as she kept asking questions like, what if he had died? What money do we even use to pay for the hospital? It got so loud in the ward that my brother and another doctor had to come over and boot us both out themselves, you guys are going to raise his chances of getting a migraine if you keep making this much noise, the doctor said. See, you've woken up a few of our patients in comas, though that may be good, it shows just how loud you guys are, my brother added, trying to lighten us up. All the way home, I got scolded at. Every wrongdoing of mine all through the relationship was laid on the table. To me she had sort of become this heartless being and I was unhappy with myself cause I felt this was all my fault. I wish I had never had that exercise. As she continued to scold me, something in me switched up. I was done with the insults and the subtle hating. I shouted in the car. Fuck. All you do now is nag me. Ever since the accident, it's as though I am nothing but I see at hashtag K to ride onto you. Looking back I probably shouldn't have said all that. After that, the rest of the ride was quiet. I could hear my heartbeat. She said nothing and so did I. I think she was shocked that I raised my voice, in our 12 years married and 17 years together, I've raised my voice at her but once, that day in the car. The kids remained at the hospital because my brother, their uncle, worked there. When we got in the house, M.A. went straight to our bedroom, she started to pack her stuff. She took enough clothes to last almost a month. She also packed a few of the kids' clothing with her, their uniforms, books, toys and some other things. She left the room. It's been a week now and I haven't heard from them. Yesterday evening I got an email. The mail contained a list for my kids' schooling, all amounting to $186,000. I knew that was how much it cost so it's not like I was blindsided by it. Also, there was a note which read. I need to know we'll be able to work this out and that you'll do your best to get back on your feet, both literally and figuratively speaking. Love, not so young M.A. I held it and stayed by the door for hours. I think I've fucked up. I need help, advice, and suggestions. I don't know what I need, I just know I need it. That's why I am here, am I wrong? How should I have handled it better? How do I get my legs back? Is there something psychological about it? I have a lot of questions, I'll be in the DMs checking out the comments. Thanks in advance. Update. For those who don't know, this post is in response to the post where I asked for help with my relationship. I have had conversations with the people who had given reasonable advice and suggestions. I was referred to a therapist and advised to seek couples counseling. Anyway, I appreciate the help that has come my way. Some people even offered to help me with cash which I turned down cause 1. I don't accept money from strangers, 2. I didn't say I had nothing, just that I didn't have enough to take care of 3. Thanks for listening and make sure to press that subscribe button for more stories like this. Have a great rest of your day or night.